here with Greg. Greg, how's it going, man? So you got a f dog. How you feel about it? Well, it's frustrating. Yeah, to be honest. Right. Yeah, I love her. Um, you know, we. You, you, Back up. Why is it frustrating? Um, well, she's uh, she's a total handful, and. Uh, um, Why is it frustrating? Um, I guess I. You start thinking a certain way. You ready? The only thing that frustrates you is something you need. Which basically means you need, you got your kid, the kid would frustrate you. You got a spouse, well, you don't need that, you get rid of it anyway, but it still frustrates you. Right. But a dog, you sell it in a minute, so why would it frustrate you? It's not that important. That's your first lesson in life with dogs. They're not that important. Okay. You don't like what I'm saying, do you? Well, no, not... Think about it. If your dog is your creature of service how important is it really unless it can serve you you're right so take the emotions out of it and make it less important you will lift the burden right off that dog completely because the dog makes you important you don't make the dog important that's the equation that many people have wrong nowadays and this is a mentality that you need to begin with in order to begin doing things because if you start training a dog and still have the mindset that led to the trouble or maintain the trouble is going to backfire on you real hard mm -hmm. and then you're screwed yeah right yep. so she's not that important okay right so I'm going to ask you one question what's this dog worth to you well uh, I guess that's a hard question um, no, I, it's not. she's either worth something or she's not which one is it well, she's definitely worth something. I, it was my choice to keep her, so this was uh, coming out of a. Uh, what I'm talking about, I'm talking about her value as a dog. Um, it doesn't mean you get rid of it. It doesn't mean anything. What it means is you have to have a starting point based on the dog's psychology. Dogs, like wolves, are only included according to value. Our job is to make them valuable. So, what's her value right now? Um, not, I guess. Uh, you know, it's, it, she's a huge, uh, it, it's a lot of stress on me at the moment. Okay, so she's not that valuable, right? I don't think of it that way, but... Uh, well, you have to, because that starts to get your mindset going. What I'm trying to tell you is that this is how dogs work. If their behavior is not great, their inclusion isn't that much in the beginning. If their behavior is not that great, then they're rewarded very little. Mm -hmm. If their behavior improves slightly, then the reward increases slightly. Okay. The way they work is if you completely include them and you love them and you pet them and you show all this affection, you're telling that dog that its behavior is perfectly acceptable. And then what happens afterwards is you're trying to train it, telling it that it's not. And that's when you start to get into the anxiety problems, right? Right. You see where I'm going with this now? Uh-huh. Yeah, so you got to get that mindset. So if I were to say to you that you had a $20 an hour budget on a money basis, because that's just how I put it, what would she be worth paying right now based on what she does for you? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> I, I don't even know. How, I, I bet probably five bucks. I've seen your dog. Can I tell you what I'd pay her? Not, probably nothing. $3.25. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, because she's a, she's your dog, right? She's supposed to do what you ask and serve you and make your life easy. Now I'm going to ask you something. Okay. Reverse it. If this was your dog looking at you and said, I got a $20 an hour budget, what do you think she'd pay you? How come you're stammering? Well, I'm just thinking, uh, you know, I'd say, I mean, I, 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 I feel like I do a pretty good job. Um, really? Yeah. Uh, how do you figure? I'm not trying to condescend you. I want you to start thinking a certain way. Really? How do you figure? Well, I mean, I, I provide for her and I play with her. And, and uh, I mean, you know, I, you know, I don't know. Like, okay, so you play with her. Do you seek affection from her? Um. I, well, I used to. I, I've cut that out in the last couple of weeks. Well, here's how it is. You see how you got your stress and anxious and everything else and frustrated with the dog? Mm-hmm. Right. You would sit there and say that you'd pay her, I don't know, she's not worth that much. I guess we're getting on the right path. Well, now I want you to look at it that your dog is suffering frustration and anxiety.
society as well. Where do you think it's coming from? Me. Okay, so what would you be worth being paid if that was if she was your boss and you were she was doing you were doing that to work? That's how you got to start thinking. Right. So what we want to do is tip the scale, which means <clears throat> you're highly valuable, and she's going to increase in value. But it's not by what you're doing; it's what you've got to change in order to get it done. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. So get that mindset right, because people who give dogs everything and seek their affection and play a lot and the dogs badly behave and they completely include them and they get frustrated and they get upset and they get stressed you have zero value to that animal mm -hmm. because you're supposed to be dominant and dominants don't suffer those emotions at all okay. they're very direct and they get things done and they know where they're going right mm -hmm. so that's what's going to make you valuable and you gauge your inclusion with this dog and your affection based on her value so you could be far more valuable. But that's how you got to start thinking. Hey, Lauren. Yeah. Do you hear any more barking? No, I actually don't. <laughs> those are those two dogs that I was having a nightmare with on Monday. Yeah. What do you hear now? Oh. So how many trips? They've gone every single night since Monday, right? No, they haven't. They went to one night, they missed a night on Tuesday. They were out last night, and now they're out today. Right, so these dogs, if we were to talk about it, Greg, they had a chip on their shoulder because their, their owners spoiled them. Mm -hmm. And their owners were weak seeking their affection. I did the exact opposite, and within three days, I got them traveling in my truck absolutely quiet. You should have heard it Monday night. And they broke into a fight in my front seat. <laughs> 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 well, they know we're at a stop now. So well, they know you're talking it. about them. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, Greg, you have to start understanding what it is to be dominant in order to be effective with your training. See, the biggest problem people do is they pull moves of being dominant with training, and then they go back to being submissive when they're not training, and that creates an even bigger problem in your dog. Right. So this is why I try to get a mindset into somebody to get them to understand that. From this point on, you no longer go backwards. Okay. So, your dog doesn't get any acknowledgement for being an idiot. Okay? Okay. Not a correction, nothing. She whines, she cries, so what? And two, so what means you don't get frustrated. Define. She does not, wait a minute. She the, does not. Yeah. Define correction. Well, we don't sit there and start jerking the chain and getting mad and and losing our tempers or else getting frustrated and, and just giving up. It's no way either one of those are proper. Would you, would you say okay. saying anything to her? Because she, she's wanting you to even say or touch or look at her, no. right? Nope. She's nobody. You say nothing. I say absolutely nothing. If I'm going to say something when a dog is badly behaved, it's going to follow through with something that isn't so pleasant. I'm going to back what I say. So unless I'm willing to do that right now, and I don't have a strong relationship with this dog, I wouldn't choose to even remotely attempt that because the dog doesn't understand why you would even do it. Right. So no, you just stay calm. <laughs> right? You just stay calm and you, you remember this, whatever you start, you got to finish. The problem is when you got a dog that's highly anxious like yours, uh -huh. everything you say to it is praise. Mm -hmm. Because she's so high in the side from the point of kicking her right in the head, which I don't want you to do. No. This is the part people don't understand, right? Uh -huh. So when you stay calm, you also got to time it. So you wait it out. Who has more will, the dog or you? So when you get frustrated, you don't have that extra strong will that a dominant has over a subordinate, right? Um, you're actually being lesser because she's controlling your emotions. That's why you say nothing. Think about this. If you say something like sit three times, by the th third time you said it, you're frustrated because she's not doing it, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, but then at the same time, because you get frustrated, you're trying to carry authority, you become submissive in her eyes. So why would you put yourself in that position? When you sit there and don't acknowledge her, because that's what she understands, and then she does something right, and then you quickly say, good girl, then what happens is you're the patient woman who's got a stronger will, 
You're the one who rewards accordingly because you're watching and observing as opposed to reacting. And finally, the dog gets gets the cue. If I'm calm and and I do this right, oh my God, I get a pat in the head. This is the way to go. Instead of sitting there going, well, I'm all wired. He's going to stay sick to me anyway. He's ineffective. What's he going to do to me? Ah, he's not serious. Screw him, and I'll keep this up. That's how they think. Okay. I was describing to Greg what you're doing, that you're, like, opening the gate to the car lot, and you're putting the guard dogs in, and then you're locking it. That's right. Yeah, that's what it is. I have, I have eight dogs. Sheesh. Yeah. I was going to say, Greg had mentioned that when his dad interacts with Maggie and Greg's gone, he has a, she, has a, yeah. she has a different personality. So go ahead and tell him about what your dad noticed. Well, yeah, so my dad is helping me remodel a bathroom, and so he's been spending some time at my house when I'm at work. And I've told him, I'm like, well, you know, Maggie, I'm crating Maggie while I'm gone. Um, if I'm, you know, and if I'm gone for eight or ten hours, he usually stops by to let her out to pee and get some water and stuff. Anyway, um, when he's there with her, he take, you know, like, you know, she's good as gold. She lays down, she doesn't bark, she doesn't whine. Um, the second I pull in the driveway, it's, uh, it's, you know, psycho city. So what does that tell you? Um, don't worry. I went through the same thing. No, no. I mean, I, 35 I, years ago. I learn. I'm learning, uh, you know, I've learned a whole lot, especially, in, you know, in the last couple of weeks, you know, since the video. Um, but I know that, you know, I, I've always known that there's work that, you know, I'm the one that needs to be doing, you know, I got to do work with me. Not, you know, it's, it's not just the dog. It's. it's Yeah. Okay, how old is your dad? Uh, oh, my dad is 67. He's 10 years older than me. He's in between my dad. Okay, so up until my generation, I'm 56. It was very simple. Yeah. You achieved good things as a kid, and you were rewarded accordingly for doing it. Uh -huh. In today's day and age, it's let me help you do good things because you're too important and I don't want you to fail. Whereas his generation and mine sat back and watched you fail. <laughs> and that was it. And you lost for failing. Today we prevent failing. So your dad knows not to do, to do exactly what I tell him I'm telling you to do. He doesn't make that damn dog important. Uh -huh. Actually, has no, he likes the dog. He's like my dad. My dad always said, uh, you know, what do you got this dog for? Well, I would tell him and say, okay, well, is she fitting the bill? No? Okay, so why are you making her so important? How about teaching her how to achieve and rewarding her accordingly as opposed to giving her the whole kick and boodle at once? Mm-hmm. Right? So your dad sits there and just the dog's part of him as opposed to something he's trying to desperately make a part of, part of or be a part of. That's right. the difference. Yep. Hmm? Absolutely. That's what it is. And it's not just a physical thing, it's also mental. Mm hmm You see nothing. You see, you have to understand the concept of dogs, Greg, based on mother dog. Many people don't get this concept. Uh, like, And you heard it in, in the tape. And I've walked with her. It's a puppy that acts like yours, dog does. Uh -huh. If it was a baby and it was all erratic like that, it wouldn't survive. She wouldn't even bother feeding it. Yeah. And even if it's screaming and it's dying, she just throws it in the corner and says, see how you're weak. Mm -hmm. So why dogs dysfunction is because that's what they understand. But we as people transpose that needy frustration and anxiety wanting to gain control at a rather rapid, quick pace. Almost like a self-gratifying masturbation, as I will call it. Okay. And the dog gets confused because it only knows something else. Mm -hmm. Reward for achievement, not compensation for being a loser. In the world of dogs, losers die. In our world, we give them friggin' ribbons. Right. Participation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you've got to you got to understand that whatever works good for a human does not work good for a dog simply because it's not a human being. Yeah. The opposite. So let's say a human being is frantic and upset and scared or frustrated what do you do you try to talk to them and calm them down right uh -huh. that's not what you do with dogs because when you do that to a dog you actually feed it 
Mm-hmm. You know, now if you walked away from a human that was frustrated and screaming and angry and all this other stuff, you'll probably be resented for it. Mm-hmm. When you deal with a dog, you're respected. Mm-hmm. Hey, tell them, tell them about the uh, concept of what what you give attention to or praise to, um, you get more of. Talk about that. What do you mean? Like the. I mean, it, literally, when I, when I had Maggie, I don't know, it was only like 48 hours, but, it, you know, just her looking through the reflection of the door, looking for anything, a look at, in her direction. I mean, if, if she could get the wind to move in her direction, she would think she was winning. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, because that's what dogs do to people. They control their emotions. And the other thing is, is when people praise dogs, what you target specific what you're dealing with. So I would give you an example of this. Usually what I start off with is a dog looking at me or coming to me. I don't ask a dog to sit. I don't ask a dog to say. I don't even ask a dog to heal. It's those two things. So if I'm out with that dog in the backyard and I'm cutting the lawn and I notice out of the corner of my eyes and I my half dog and it looks at me, I'll go, good girl. But that's the only time I'll acknowledge it. If it comes to me, instead of giving it a dog biscuit for breathing, I won't give it any treats other than, come, here, there's a piece of a good dog, and then I walk away. And I'll spend and do that. This is a Chuck Eisenman thing, right? And then you start to get your results a lot faster because those are your two basic fundamentals of being dominant. One, and two, not asking much of a dog that's highly stressed. Three, with the case of this dog, I'd have her out, and you would have her out with you for a long period when you're working with her, but you're not really doing anything with her. You're hanging out in the backyard, and she's yapping and carrying on or whatever. You might have a split second that she'll stop to breathe and be quiet, and you sit there, you go, good girl. And if she starts to get upset again, you say nothing. You don't even look at her. That's how you get your stuff real quick, right? Okay. And then don't, don't overpraise either, Greg. Don't act so happy that she did something good for you. Why? Then you start to become apologetic and needy. Oh, geez, you did this for me. Oh, so much. Thank you. Oh, that's just so wonderful. Right. Really? What did the dog do? Look at you? Oh, okay. I guess you're not that important, then, eh? Okay. So, so, so I guess he's more or less he's more or less in detachment mode because she's like super he's totally detached. Yeah. He. He's like, she's addicted to his attention to... Well, no, she's manipulated the attention, oh. and he's given her attention in both accords. He either gives her attention for being good, or he gives her attention, and no matter what way he decides, whether it be frustration, whatever, he's acknowledging her bad behavior. The dog's confused. Yeah. Which one are you going to pay attention to, Greg? What one do you want? No, oh, it's positive. Okay. The rest is irrelevant. Yeah. You know, I get a lot of people coming to me, well, you know, I was just talking to a guy right here, and he says, this is the question he asked me, Sam, we're going to spay Tina, and it's a female of mine, she's not soft. When do you think Tina's going to settle down? You know what my answer was? When you do. Mm-hmm. There was nothing to do with Tina. I get a kick out of people mentioning the dog as the first part of the equation of a conversation. It is not. Under any circumstances. It's an expendable non-rare species mm. it's not like it's important as a panda bear it's not as important as oh i don't know a siberian tiger that's going extinct to dog right you walk out in the street corner and you get five of them what's the problem mm-hmm. it's not that important so put the importance where the importance lies your dog is supposed to serve you greg okay so if it's going to serve you then reward it for when it does in whatever small way Okay. A small thing it does, but don't get overly excited about it. Right. Because you don't own it. That's my dog, and you're training it for me. Right. That's the next mindset you got to have. Yeah. Right? So uh-huh. Until you begin this, we're going to talk about a whelping box. I'm going to give it to you. Are you ready? Yep. But you're born. The transference is stressful. You think about it, you know, you're in a nice warm place. You don't have to worry about hunting for food. Temperature variances are not there. It's not cold. It's not hot. You're sheltered. There's an extra wall outside of your life on top of your clothes up in another wall. Now all of a sudden you're born. Now you got to breathe. Now you got to scream. Now you got to crawl. And now you got to fight for your sister with your sisters and your brothers 
to get some food or you're a dead dog. Period. How stressful is that? Yeah. Birthing, having life, giving life like you're born is just as stressful as dying. They're both equivalents. That's what people don't understand. You're coming out of basically being dead other than a pulse because you're inside a womb mm -hmm. into living. And when you're dying, you're leaving your life and, and dying off. It's the same stress. The difference is, is how stressful is it really? Well, okay. So we got this puppy doing this. That amount of stress, what goes on next? <laughs> That's the stress of change. Do you notice how your dog, every time something new happens, gets overly stressed? Mm -hmm. Okay. So when these pups are born, the first thing that they do, and I watch the bitches do it all the time, they're laying down and busy whelping another one that's coming through the birth canal. They don't even acknowledge that pup. But what that pup does is it's finding and looking for a way to feed and get warm. She doesn't pick it up and put it under there. Right. It has to find its way. There's no acknowledgement. So hyper, anxious, scatterbrained gets you what? Nothing. Now, what happens when that puppy finds the mom's cheek? It gets there, it gets warm, it gets food, and then it gets warm, gets licked. So, you gotta find your food, you gotta find your warmth, and then you get praised for doing so. What do we try to do? We try to help it find its warmth, we try to help it find its food, and then we give it lavishly affection for being scatterbrained. Mm -hmm. It's the exact opposite. You lose your credibility. Right. So all I want you to do with this dog is practice this. When she's an idiot, you say nothing. She doesn't exist. When she stops for half a second and looks at you nicely, guess what? Good girl. Based on how much is she worth? Zero, like three hundred three dollars. So you give her a three to five dollar pat, five cent pat. Do you know what a five cent pat is? Uh, yeah. I, I, tap on the shoulder. Good dog. That's about it. Gotcha. Your voice is absolutely calm at all times. Okay. There. No frustration, no overexcitement, no nothing. Just good dog. Okay. Hey, what are you doing? Come here. It's not, oh, my God, you're a good dog. I'm going to kill you. That's what human beings do. Right. Dogs don't work that way. Okay. Okay, so. Then you better follow through according to the dog. So if a dog is barking and growling profusely and you don't comply, i.e. by backing off when you're trying to break into a house, can you tell what's going to happen to you? I'm going to get bit. Okay, good. So if you're going to use that voice, what are you willing to carry through to back it? Right. Then don't use it. All right. Okay, so I have a, qu I mean now? I have a question. So, um, I try to explain to people, this is what is missing from the dog world in general, is people like, oh, you go out, you train your dog, um, throughout the day, you do it in the morning, you do it when you come home, or whatever you do. You don't do that, but the difference is, what do you call training? That's the, the issue, right? Like, what kind of, no. we want to talk about what kind of schedule, uh, Greg has to have, and then secondly, um, the importance of when he does train her, he's got to be on. You know what I mean? Like, he's yeah, got to be focused be and ready. Never ever show to your dog that you're off ever, even when it's sitting in the house. Yeah. I mean, because it's because if you can't focus, you need to put her in the crate, you, put, you need to put her away. You have to remove the dirty water. You don't let it develop anymore. No more bad habits. Okay. The only way you could possibly do that is to create the dog. So always, I mean, like, you know, I get up, say I get up at 7 a.m. I go to bed at 10 p.m. Um, I work for, you know, for eight hours in there. So, you know, I get up and let her out of the crate and then what? Okay. So where do you let her out of the crate in the house or outside? Uh, the crate's in, it's in the, I got a spare bedroom. It's next to mine. Okay. So. Oh, I'll let her out to use the restroom. Okay, good. That's fine. And then you're preparing the food in the house? Uh, yeah, usually I let her out, bring her back in, and then, and then, yeah, feed her. Uh, it just depends. Usually like three to five minutes. It's not a real long time. Uh, you want to try 15 to 20. Okay. Why such a short time? 
Well, well, usually because it's that early, and uh, she doesn't do well outside by herself, as you've seen. I'm want to I want to work on that in the afternoons when you know. Uh huh. So you got a dog that's wired in your presence. Yeah. Well. And she's not focused. She's wired. There's a difference. If you go outside and 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 you walk around and don't say nothing, or she goes to the bathroom, and then you say good girl, and you play a little bit of ball or something, get all that pepper out of her, then you bring her in the house. Now you're spending time with her while she's calm. Okay, that makes sense. Uh-huh. Farrah just friggin' loves me. It's almost like uh, like this dog, if she could take me to bed, she would, okay? And I just throw her outside, and she's outside for a good 20 minutes, half an hour, going to the bathroom, getting some pepper out, then I'll go outside with her, and I'll walk around and do what I normally do. Either I take the garbage to the road, or, you know, I go out and turn the, the water hose on for the kennel, or check one of my vehicles, or whatever it is, and I say nothing to her. Unless she's sitting right next to me. And I'll go, good girl. That's it. Yeah, I'll bring her in the house and I'll feed her and I'll put her in a crate. And then I'm off to work. Mm -hmm. But I won't put a dog out for three minutes. I mean, you know, you got to think of this, Greg. That dog is pent up all night. When you're giving her three minutes, what the hell do you think you're going to achieve? Right. Well, I mean, the reason I'm, I'm not, you know, the reason I'm, she usually goes out and by the time, like, you know, she turns around and wants to get back in. And that's why I'm saying she's only out there that long. Um, yeah, no, I get so. it. So that's, that's how you're feeding it because you don't want the noise from those people. Well, I think the, right. the, the problem, the difference between, and, and Sam and I have argued about this for years, is that I live in the suburbs, I live in a neighborhood. We have an HOA, we have noise ordinance, we have all this stuff, and he has massive property way out in the country. It is, okay, it, so here's your next step. Get on a bicycle and start riding. For 20 minutes. Either way, you got to get rid of that energy. Okay, so if I take her out and play with, like, if I run her with the, you know, I, with the Kongs, whatnot, for 10 minutes, I don't get her. Oh, did you hear me? Get on a bicycle or something, something that, or go on for a walk where she's loose and you're not saying anything to her unless she comes to you. Like, you got to find an area to get rid of this pepper. Okay. So you're you're saying she, he can walk her at this point. Well, he can walk her. Uh, don't worry about healing or anything. I almost look at, you know, how big is his backyard? Is it like yours? Uh, close. Pretty close. All right, then you can walk around in there and she falls asleep. And when she sits quietly, you can do it. So get up 20 extra minutes or at least you did something with her. Mm -hmm. As opposed to putting her right back in and penning her up again. Whether you're putting her in a crate or putting her loose in the house, she's still pent. She's got all this energy. And then you're asking her to stay calm. That creates a big frustration. Right. Well, that's, like dangling it. that's like starting on a trip to Florida in the middle of winter here. And you go 100 miles and you turn back. Okay? So guess what you're going to have on the end of the trip? Yeah. Arguments. Well, I usually play with her in the morning, but that's, I guess, my question since I've got you here is, like, I mean... I'll play with a dog right away. I'll just take her on and walk it and make it follow me. Okay. Look for it to calm down, then I'll acknowledge it. Okay, okay. So Sounds... When a dog is calm, I don't, I don't use play at the stage of the game to try to appease energy because it doesn't work. You're feeding it. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. You got an anxiety problem, you show her a ball, she's going to heighten even more, and then when you throw it, she's being rewarded for being heightened. Okay. We start playing when you're calm. Okay. We start going for walks when you're calm. We start talking to you when you're calm. And when you want to say, we feed you when you're calm. That's correct. Yeah. Don't do the sit and stay, wait for your food shit. Well, here's this dog sitting on pins and needles going, when am I going to get my food? He said, okay, eat it. What are you doing? Well. I said, I hold a bowl and walk around with it. Now it's for 10 minutes. So that dog lays down on its own. Now I'll give it to it. Well, I was just, I was just contacted about a pit bull that's jaw pops uh, when they have it sit and wait for the bowl and it's jaws popping and then they, and then they present the bowl to it. They let it, they feed it when it's jaws popping. But see, this is a mis misconception of the concept. So if I get into that concept, you know I trained and taught at a wolf sanctuary up in Grand Rapids. We use it as one of our camps. And I'll use the example here. 
So they had no meat. You've heard the story long, but I might as well say it to Greg. So I go out and help to get meat because wolves do not do well on kibble. They get very healthy. So the dominant wolf was throwing his beef and his meat and his roast beef over the fence, <coughs> gather it all up. Okay? And he starts picking away at it nice and slowly, nice and slowly while the other wolves are waiting. You think he gave them two minutes and said, okay, just... nope. He left it there, laid next to it, even peed on it, and made them wait two hours until they were all sitting down and being quiet and almost gave it up. Then he said, okay, eat now. So he knows how to maintain order. These other people are doing the opposite. If you're going to make a dog sit for its food, well, you better wait about 25 minutes, 30 minutes, then give it to the dog. Why? Because that's how long it's going to take for its anxiety to drop. Mm -hmm. Are you going to create a food possession? You know, I don't have that kind of time to do with my dogs out in the kennel, but I just have the food in their kennels. The door is open. They've had their exercise. They seem to be preparing it. Sometimes they're out there for half an hour. They know their food's in there. Right. And then they uh, go in and eat. i got no food aggression, none whatsoever. And I don't interrupt them while they're eating either. I just leave them alone. You know, I could be inside the kennel doing something or with them, but I don't touch them. I don't do anything. They don't care. Even my worst food aggressive dog that I've had would let me walk in the kennel while he's eating. He doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. Raw meat didn't matter because I don't create a competitive thing. And if you're going to do something like that, sit and stay, which is the ultimate dominant move, what is, what is, how about the rest of the spectrum in your daily conduct in the eyes of the dog? Nobody truly understands what it is to be dominant across the board, so you don't do it. Just don't do it before. Okay. Not yet, you know? Right. Okay, so, you know, you let her out for two or three minutes in the morning. That's no good. What I tell people to do is put the dog out in the backyard and get rid of the energy. Mm -hmm. That's walking around. Let her walk around on her own. If you have to go out with her right now, go out with her. But then make sure that there's a purpose to you going out with her. And it's not the pacifier whininess. It's out to gauge your, your affection with her when she stops whining and she calms down. Right. Okay, so that's number one. You get in the house and you go to work, right? Uh huh. And then when do you get home? Uh, you know, about five o'clock. All right. So she's in that house all by herself all day. Well, you know, typically yes. Um, more recently, like I said, my father's. No, there's no middle. What one is it? Well, my father's been there recently, you know, helping. But yeah, on, in, on a normal day, okay, yes. So he left her out to the bathroom, right? Yeah, well, yeah, he lets her out, and then he okay. puts her on her on her on her uh, leash. Yeah, and then what does he do? Yeah, then he goes and works on the bathroom, and she just lays. There you go, and he completely freaking ignores her, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Until she's completely calm, <laughs> he might turn and say, "Oh, you're being good." And he goes back to work, right? Uh huh. So why don't you do the same? Have her out when you're doing something. And that way you're preoccupied with that, and then you slowly observe when she calms down. And remember, you still have to exercise the dog. You can't ask the dog to be calm when it's bent up with energy, right? Right. And then slowly acknowledge, but you also got to be attentive that she doesn't get into trouble. Uh-huh. So you don't leave the dog loose while you're doing the dishes or making dinner or whatever, and then she wanders off in the bathroom and shows up the toilet paper. No, nope, bad news. Right. Or gets that okay, trash how long can. do you think you should have her out for, right? No, oh, you, what, you mean like Walker? Yeah, or in the house. Um, so when you get home at night, what do you do? Well, I usually take her outside and we uh, we play. Um, and play right away, right? Yeah, typically, yeah. Okay, stop that. Okay. Just walk around the backyard until she falls you hold a handful of food if you have to. Okay. All right, and then uh, when she's calm, then play. And then once you've played with her a little bit and you get the energy out, then take her for a walk. Okay. Don't go for a walk asking her to do anything. Just go for a walk on a lunge line back and forth somewhere. Quiet. It has to be a quiet area, even if you've got to drive to it. But this will be two weeks from now. Yeah, he now. he has a park kind of across the street. Well, there's Mount St. Francis, too. You can do that there, you know? Yeah. But, um... So, you want to start with your backyard. You want to start with your driveway. You want to start to the first part, you know, three or four houses down back and forth. And then maybe twice a week go to the park. That's how I do it. But until you get yourself straight, don't start doing any of this crap. I got you. 
You have to get yourself straight. There's no turning back, right? So you basically, I, I, I'm not really going to, I mean, just very little, uh, like you said, the five cent pat, if she does something good, but other than that, like nothing. Well, I'm going to ask you something. What frustrates you the most right now? It's, well, it's right now, it's that, um, it's obvious that she's, uh, the white and the hyper anxiety. It's, it? it's that, and the fact that, uh, that she see that I've, I've recognized that she sees herself as the dominant, and that, that bothers okay. me. Like that she, well, you know, can tackle. why does that bother you? Well, because she doesn't pay attention to me. You know, it's like having a, it's because you're ready for it. You ready? Yeah. It's because you're not worth paying attention to. How's that one? All right. It goes right back on you. I know you don't like what I'm saying, but that's the truth. Would you? Why would you look at somebody? Think about that. Why would you focus and look at somebody? Because you're attracted to them. Okay. What makes you attractive to them? Now let's forget the male female thing. A general person, I don't care whether it's male and female. Let's say it's somebody in the workplace that's doing a presentation. Mm-hmm. I guess they talk like they know what they're doing, and then they can show it and back it, right? Yep. That would make you pay attention, so what they have to say is relevant? Mm-hmm. Okay, so if that person stood up there and said, oh, my audience were a bunch of assholes because they didn't pay attention to me, what is that person now, what would you think of that person saying that? No, they're a loser. Okay. Yeah. What are you saying about yourself? Well. With your audience that pays no attention to you. Right. Stop being a loser. Who cares? All right. Why don't you start being worth looking at? Which means you no longer get upset. You no longer get. This is how you learn how to be dominant. You can't become dominant in one day. Mm -hmm. But you can do something relatively small that doesn't allow you to lose points. So, if you were to walk around in the backyard, even with a handful of food, and you see her calm, and you call her to you, and she's beside you, you give her a treat, and you say, good dog, great. If she's jumping around, trying to jump over the fence as long as she can't get out, or jumping and pawing at you and all this stuff, ignore it. Okay. So and now what's happening? You're telling her you're valueless unless you do what for me? Obey. Or respect me. Or, or respect, okay. yeah. That, yeah. So let me tell you a little bit about what she does in the backyard because this is uh, like, you know, kind of what we're talking about. If I take her out there and I've got her on a leash to walk her around um, what she does in the mornings if, and she only does this when I'm outside like I said typically if I just let her out she turns around and wants back in but I have about She's immature yes yeah, so I have about nine trees back there and uh, you know it's a uh, it's like the Ewok city for the squirrels so uh, she basically bounces from tree to tree um, you know looking up looking yeah, up into the her energy and uh, she's just you said just let her waste her energy let her waste her energy yeah um, and then it was, see, so you think I should go out there with her and let her do that without a, not, no leash? Just let her do that? Sit on the park bench. Okay. Sit on your deck. Have a, a drink, some Kool-Aid or a cigarette or whatever and let her wear herself down. Okay. And then what happens is when she wears herself down, you say, come here, and that's the resolution. Eventually, we will address that. Okay. That's not the point you want to address right now. You see... Predators are smart. Mm -hmm. They know not to waste their time on a wasted effort. Gotcha. They know not to burn energy because that could cause them to be weakened. So why don't you allow your dog to weaken herself? Mm -hmm. As long as she can't get to the squirrel and kill it, I don't care. I don't you know. Let her do it. Yeah, she hadn't caught one yet. Okay, and then when she's exhausted and she gives it up and you go, come here, good girl, how effective have you been now? Okay. And there'll be a day, because now you're teaching her to come back to you when she sees the squirrels, that you will put a long line on her and she goes after a squirrel, you're going to give her a good, firm correction, but she's going to understand what you mean by this. You're not going to use it to train her, you're going to use it to get her to understand when you've been consistent. Uh Uh-huh. You know, this is how I deal with dog aggression at home. Um, I have, well, Maverick hates dogs, so I put him now in front of his worst enemy. They're eight feet apart, and he barks all day long to the point where you hear him start to get to that whiny stress bark. He lost about five pounds in a week 
And now he lays calmly. Why? What did he learn? No resolution. The mm. only resolution is that I'm exhausting myself here and I'm compromising my health. They're not stupid. And now I can walk him past. Yeah, he looks at him and just tell him get on with it because now and then I'll take him out when he's exhausted. Mm -hmm. So now I have total control without a fight. He has no fight left in him. You got to see the exercise yard that he's in. The three foot hole. It's a track that's in an absolute circle. Yeah. And he runs himself down to nothing. He almost wants to pass out. I take him out. I say, good. How do you feel? Guess what? He slowed his pace down now. It took a year and a half. <clears throat> he doesn't run like that anymore. Let them exhaust themselves as long as they don't get hurt. Okay. You know what I mean? Or hurt anything. Right. You know? You see, what happens is people try to control with no resolution. What's the resolution? You stop the game. It's fun. I'm chasing squirrels, and you put a leash on it and say, stop that. What makes you think you don't want to come back yet? Yeah. Think of yourself. If you were a set of car keys on the table, right? Mm -hmm. You just got your driver's license and your parents go to bed. What are you going to do? Take the keys. Right. Now, eventually, after six weeks of you taking the car and you take it out of the joyride, and they don't find out it's anything. Are you so apt to take the keys all the time now? Or you just said, well, I've been there, done that. It was boring. Yep. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So here's the next question. If your dad were to sit there and control the keys and leave them out for you to take, and he knows you're going to take them, and he texts you, and he sits there and he goes, well, I'm disappointed in you, Greg. Don't do it again. How, how far is that going to go? Yeah, right. Okay. Right. But if he sat there and kicked your ass, would you touch those keys again? Probably not. Okay. So here's the next rule. You already understand not to touch the keys. So if you got an ass kicking, would you know what it was about? Yeah. Yeah. So it would be effective, right? Uh-huh. So here's what people do. They'll go out there and start scolding a dog for chasing squirrels and desperately fight for it. Then they get angry. Then they'll throw it on his back or give it a good correction with a leash. The dog doesn't understand why you're doing it. So what do you look like? Hey, oh, yeah. it's, it's irrelevant. So how about this? How about letting the dog exhaust itself and then when it's tired, it comes to you and you say, come here. Now you're teaching that dog that, you know, you'll regulate it and then you'll, you'll eventually do obedience around there and tell the dog to recall. But first, let the dog figure it out on its own in a safe way. Okay. Chase the squirrels. You know, I mean, you come to my house, I've got three pet chipmunks, three of them now. Chester had kids. And they walk around following me when I'm feeding the dog. i got chipmunks that follow me everywhere all over the place in the morning. My dogs don't touch them at all. The simple reason is, number one, they know they're mine. Number two is I've taught them not to chase them, but they've never learned to chase them because they've been in kennels. Uh -huh. Your dog has got the opposite. She knows to chase them. She knows it's entertaining. So how do you make something that entertaining something that's not so fun anymore? Simple. Let her exhaust herself. Okay. Most, most trainers would uh, nix that big time. They would absolutely correct her for that. Well, what are you doing by correcting it? You're pending it up. You're not really resolving anything. Because then every time the dog gets a chance to be out there on its own, it's going to do it. Remember what the key here, the key here is that the dog's the same whether you're there or not, right? Or There's an old rule in life, the more you experience, the less apt you want to be excited about it. Mm-hmm. Right? Right. There will be a point that you will correct it, but first let this dog learn that it's a, it's a wasted effort. If you watch wolves hunting elk and and the hunt becomes dangerous or they're getting exhausted, they'll give it up. Why will they give it up? Because they know damn well that if they keep going, they're going to hurt themselves. Your dog doesn't know this. Mm -hmm. Because you've always interrupted it. Where's your resolution? So you're not sitting there hammering her good ones for doing it. 
and nor are you letting her exhaust herself and realizing that it's fruitless. Okay. Where does she get left? I'll give you. A, I, I, I'll tell you what to do. Here's a test. Let her go out there and touch the squirrels. Have a leash on her. Grab the leash and tell her to stop and tell me if she gets even height, even more. Right. Because I guarantee you, she will. Mm-hmm. So what does that say about you? You're feeding it. So let it wear itself out. Then you come in and be the hero. Oops. Okay. Right? Okay. You're not going to do this permanently. You're just going to put this mindset in the dog that chasing things is a fruitless effort. Right, right. Yeah, that was the biggest problem that I've had recently when I take her outside to play. Is be, I guess I've been going out immediately wanting to play when she wants to chase the squirrels. And eventually she'll come to me. But And then you can play with her. Right, I see that now. Yeah, it makes total sense. Okay. Then you can play with her. You can sit there and play with her when she comes back to you. And even if she's exhausted, you just throw a ball once or twice. So now what is the reward? Without conflict. Oh, you're getting to play ball if I leave those squirrels alone. Okay, this is cool. Okay. And then when she's done, when she's exhausted, and, if, you know, I, I just inside and back on a leash or back in her crate. No, she can hang out with you for being exhausted and being good, then put her in a crate. Don't just put her in a crate right away. Okay. Get the whole thing. Right. She exhausted herself. Okay. But did she come to you? Yeah. So where's the reward for coming to you? Okay. This is why you don't have dogs so freely in the house all the time. Because you need to save everything you can and make it a reward. Yeah. Pats. Your voice, your car rides, and the amount of time in the house. It's all a reward system based yeah. on accomplishment. Yeah, before before I came to Lauren, um, of course, I've known Lauren a long time, but I was with my ex and her two kids. They all lived in the house. And so we got Maggie two years ago, and um, she was crate trained. You know, she she's never peed or pooped in the house, but, I mean, we left her out during work. How old were the kids? Oh God! Um, I mean, at this juncture, they're eleven and fourteen. But uh, so you know, subtract two years from that. We were about nine and ten when she came, maybe. Yeah, something like that. Yep. Was she gravitating to the children? Um, she probably didn't get what she wanted out of them. Like, you know, the the teenager, he didn't want to. You know, he he'd pet her twice a day. And, I'm asking, did she like the kids? Uh, kinda. I guess you okay. could, you know, I, I think she, you know. How long have you been separated? They moved out the beginning of May, so June, July, August. Well, that explains why there's a lot of anxiety. You got a major dynamic change, too, on top. Were they living in that house, or did you go to another house? Well, that, yeah, with the same house. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So, you, okay, so it's the same house. The ex left, right? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay, so the only thing you have to deal with is the dynamic change. Well, that explains quite a bit. Yeah, that explains it. All right, so I want you to start the plot and think, Greg. Target specific reward for the behavior that you can get. Do not try to modify any behavior in manager because it's going to only fail. And three, <laughs> start rehearsing in your own head what it is to be dominant. And every time you have an interaction with this dog, it's all right to fall back. So you got frustrated. Write it down. Right. So you can see the pattern of when you're going from being authoritative to falling down back under to having this dog control you. Do you see what I mean? Uh-huh. Were you seeking affection on that particular day when you got home? Like, hey, baby, how's it going? Or did you just walk in the house and the dog followed you and sat down calmly and you gave her a pat? Right. These are very important issues. Yeah. How many times did you appear needing of affection as opposed to her? Okay. And remember, needing of affection does not mean that you're possessive or anxious. Uh -huh. It just means that you want to die. Right. All right? Mm -hmm. How many times have you desperately tried to be acknowledged as opposed to her be wanting to be acknowledged by you? Mm -hmm. Everything has to be calm, though, right? Yep. And then we can begin... Right? So, you know, I get people that start jumping into this right away. See, what you need to realize is that you start to apply this stuff, and all of a sudden, three or four days later, you see this, this result. Boy, my dog's better already. No, the dog is analyzing like this, just what the f*** happened here. And then, because you're not well-versed or not 
reversing your reversing in your own head. Now you're leaving windows for her to manipulate you even more. Yep. So if you're gonna ask this dog to be behaved, forget that. You better learn to behave first. Gotcha. Yeah. So I told I told Greg, he said, Okay, she's making me crazy and I sent him a list of noise canceling headphones. Yeah, it's it's too bad that I get randoms at work, but uh, because I told Lauren earlier I was ready to start smoking weed again. the TED talk right. and, uh, and so what did you come up with <laughs> well yeah so on the scale um, you know kind of what I what I looked at just you know I kind of fit into a couple categories and and because there's some things sprinkled into both and and a lot of it was mainly um, before I came to an average number well I was gonna say uh, a little bit of zero and a little bit of two um, yeah yeah, I mean... The last person that sent me a text actually believes she's a three or a four. Oh. And I laughed. <laughs> oh, no. I uh, I saw some of that... That already tells me you can't look at yourself. Yeah. Right? No, I, I, I could see... Because there's been times that she's frustrated me to the point where I'm just... You know, I, I, I... Yeah, just like, okay, I'm just... Okay, so you know. now that you understand the number system, that's part of your daily routine. <clears throat> she frustrated me. I just shot down zero. Right. Want to be a zero? Right. Where I come from... You have to make the sandwiches if you uh, become a zero or you come up with a stupid comment and serve the people you've upset. And I will never allow myself to do that because that's beneath me. But what I'm trying to say to you is that the minute you start looking at what you're doing to yourself, you start to realize why she behaves the way she does and your frustration will go away. Right. Because what's frustration? No, you don't get an end result. And you keep trying, that's one. And two, you're not understanding why it's not happening. So the minute you start to see both, you don't get frustrated anymore. You know? Okay. You become effective because you're able to think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh -huh. So, if you're going to do this, number one, learn what it is to take some snippets of being somewhat partially dominant. So, the first step to being dominant is calm. Gotcha. Two, Acknowledging reward for achievement. Three, detaching yourself from the dog and don't overkill the dog. Okay, which means that you work with the animal's capacity at this given time, which is just come here and calm down, as opposed to asking for the whole kid and caboodle because you're impatient. Okay. Do you see what I mean? So under whelping premise, which is right from the beginning, Come to me for food and affection. If you're an idiot, I don't give you any acknowledgement. I mean, that's pretty simple. Yeah. And of course, what does a dog need? So here it is. Under a whelping box, a puppy is no bigger than a hamster when it's born, okay? Uh-huh. The average box for a German Shepherd is four feet by four feet. The average box for a small dog is two feet by two feet. Well... Puppy, puppies for small dogs are no bigger than a mouse. So if this puppy who's got stubs for legs has to walk two feet across a box to get food, is it being exercised? No. no. Sure it is. No. It's no different than a puppy that's got to crawl four feet across a box to get milk from mom. It's got no legs. It just crawls on its belly. Man, can you imagine moving four feet just on your belly? No. I know I would die. I'm out of shape. Right? Yep. I've become a fat old man. But to make that long, so, so you do have to give it some exercise uh -huh. with a reward at the end. So if you go in the backyard and you walk around, you're holding some food, 
and she follows you and you look and say, oh, what a good dog. Here's some food and give her a pat. Okay. And then, of course, you do it in your driveway with a long line. Just put a long line on her. You do the same thing. Don't ask her. Don't worry about pulling right now. Don't worry about sitting. And I'll tell you why. Because that comes easy once you got a dog's head clear. Right. So when I've been tossing the Kong with her, um, she does she does really good. She'll fetch it, and then she'll come back and drop it and sit. Okay. Um, Before you throw it, wait for it to calm down a little bit. Yeah, I've been hold, I've been holding it while she sits and let and I kind of let her sit for. But also look at her muscles. Are they tense? Is she googly eyed and like zoned out like she's a cracker? She's she's, she's like yeah she's she's been like that since the the second I pulled into my neighborhood. So here it is. When she's like that, then only throw it three or four feet. Okay, I've been doing that a little bit. Throw it thirty or forty feet. She'll build up and go more. But don't do this right away. Wait till she calms down a little bit first. So, which means you're in that backyard walking around with food for 20 minutes. Then maybe pull the ball out. Okay. Yeah, I'm just... Uh, just use that to get it because you're, you're f***ing yourself. Right. My, I, my concern, I guess, up to now was uh, just getting her exercise because I'm not walking her because she's berserkers. Um, you know, I, I take her out in the neighborhood and she's, you know, she's chasing every, you know, anything she sees moving, um, you know, there's a rabbit, you know, uh, six houses now and she scopes it and she's, you know, balls. All of this stuff will go away once you get rid of the anxiety. Right. And I'll tell you why. If you understand anything about the predatorial urge and you study dogs or wolves, when they're calm, they don't hunt. Mm-hmm. But when they're heightened like yours does, yeah, then it has to release it through biting or killing just because it's a predator. Right. This is why you're having such a squirrel problem. Uh-huh. You don't deal with the problems that are the end results of the spectrum. Deal with what's causing the spectrum to reach its end. Just work on being here calm. Don't worry about rabbits right now. Don't worry about squirrels. Don't worry about any of that. I guarantee you this. Mm-hmm. You get that dog calm and level. And you watch just how fast your obedience comes into play. Lauren's seen it. Okay. Within 15 minutes, I got a disobedient head being obedient like that with very little effort. But I also know how to cause the dog to calm down rather quickly. Uh huh. Because I understand that arch. You'd be amazed at how quick it happens the minute you start getting yourself straight. Right. And that's the truth. Okay. You know, I, I know trainers, and I've got a friend of mine that been training for 30 years and never understood this concept. His dog is about as unreliable as it can come. <laughs> I got 24 dogs, Greg, and I hardly spend time with them other than two points a day, 15 minutes. They run, and I bring them into a training room, and they're reasonably obedient. Far more than his, and he works years to get done, and he doesn't understand the concept. That's very simple. When something thinks that you're worth it, and you've taught it to be calm and relaxed and understand it, it'll do anything for you. So it becomes effortless. Awesome. Huh? That's great. That yeah. Yeah, that's all it is. You don't have to do anything. You just have to do it right. Well, dogs know that. I think dogs know when you're needy. Like yes. if you've had a bad day or or whatever it is, I think they they sense it on you. Well, and, let's look at ourselves, all three of us, through the course of life. We always look for that special someone that completes us. I don't care who it is. And each and every one of us have a different vision of what that person is. Now what I'm going to say to you is once you've found it, what happens to you? You calm right down. You get a perspective. You're able to think. Well, dogs are the same way. They look for a person that is going to get them through life, and they know what they're looking for. Mm-hmm. So if you've got a three or four dog per se, you better be a five. Right. If you've got a number two dog by temperament and you're a five, you know what that dog's looking for, you need to be a three. If you've got a three dog, say four or five. If you have a two dog, don't be any more than a three. And never go lower than a three. You're dead level at all times. Sometimes you have to be a little bit more nurturing and sometimes it's reckless. But either way, you're patient. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you need to talk about, um, okay, the previous owner, which Greg doesn't know, um, when, you, when you tell people, and I know there's a, a Bassett Rescue that they say, I don't know what's going on with this dog, because this foster dog, when we have it in our house, is fine, and we've, we've adopted it out, um, I don't know how many 
many times they've adopted out once or twice maybe and they get it back because it starts acting aggressive in an adoptive home and and it's funny because I said something about well I'm able to trim this dog's toenails I'm able to groom this dog I'm able to handle this dog and then it makes me nervous because I adopt them out and I don't know you could you hardly know your own family and friends to it, and here you go and you adopt it out to a total stranger if they act in the way that the previous owner who caused the damage acts that's right and the first thing I ask everybody is why do they give dogs up? No. Please tell me. That's not like it used to be when I was doing this. Right. It's different now. Why do they give dogs up? I think to each person before it's something different. There, before we even go there, does anybody that you know go out to get a dog with the process or the thought pattern of having to ever give it up? Oh, no. 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 What kind of a mindset do they have when they go to get that dog? It's going to be part of the family. Good. So, with that being said, what do they do as soon as they get the dog? Shower it with affection. Mm -hmm. And what else they do? They start teaching it things like, um, you know, the indirect... Let's talk about them. Forget about what they do. Let's talk about their personalities. Okay. They're eager, needy people. And lavish it with affection, and also have this new possessive toy that they create around all over the place. Yeah, they have a new. They have more of that dog that they're capable of. Yeah, or they have a okay, new. The basics. New. Yeah. There's a. There's somebody. It's a, a person I know that I watched their dog one day, and they said, "Oh, it's afraid of men. It's afraid of people. It's fearful of strangers." And and I think when they got it from a a breeder they took it to the ballpark like right away and it was a puppy no motor skills didn't know it was yeah overwhelmed it and so it comes to my house we ignore it it's in the bean bag licking steve's bald head <laughs> like within minutes and I, I took video of it they're like stunned to see this and i'm like well it's because steve doesn't care he's indifferent which is horrible to a dog a dog's like how could you not like me i'm awesome and my owners are you know worshiping me and how come you're not i don't understand um, so it was kind of funny. It kind of as to what is a natural phenomenon for that dog based on its upbringing, or right from birth, and what it knows. Moms ignore them until they're acknowledging and they're calm and focused. Then you give them a, hey, how you going? That's it. Yeah. Right? But ultimately, so let's get into it. So this is what they do. Then the dog becomes a nuisance roughly around 12 weeks. What do they do next? Uh -huh. They start to get impatient and they go and seek a trainer. They do their puppy classing. So they start to overwhelm it even more. Nine times out of ten, the puppy classes fail. Why? Because those f***ing trainers and those puppy class people do the same thing that that family did when they first got it. Uh -huh. It's a lose-lose. Okay, and then it finally gets out of hand, so what do they start doing next? They start to ignore it and neglect it. And it's different, Greg, what I'm telling you to ignore. They completely ignore it and resent the dog. Then where does it go? The shelter. To a shelter, right. So it goes to a shelter, and what's the first thing they do with it? They Within 24 them. hours. Yeah, they get them spayed, neutered, vaccines, and put them on the adoption yeah. floor if they pass their temperament test. What do they do before all of that? Well, they temperament test them. That's correct. We are now testing these animals under apprehensive conditions with the bombardment that they've received all their lives and doing what to them? Asking them to tolerate more under high stress. And then, let's say the dog passes the test. What do the people do when they get it home? Give it everything. The same, it's the same cycle. It. Yeah. So you, you see, so you go back into it. The only association your dog has, per se, with humans is the type of people that created that trouble. So, Greg, if you even act are mostly close with the average human being, it's going to start the trouble. Mm -hmm. That's the damage that the dog suffers from. Okay. That's why you have to be rather diligent with this, and you'll win. Okay. All you got to do is bring her back to the safest place in the world for her. And where was that? And where was her safest place? The womb. Well, before I, once, right after she was born. Okay. 
you know, in that six or seven segment progression that goes on. Um, so what we have to admit here is that we create the dog problems. Oh, yeah. And it's, all, it's up to us to unwind ourselves so that we don't keep creating them. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> okay? So right now, let's sum it up. You will only acknowledge that dog when it's calm. You will help it get calm by walking around in the backyard in the mornings. So get up 20 minutes earlier, walk around the backyard with her, hold some food. She's calm. Give it to her. Yeah, you want to get some energy out? Once you realize that she's got her brains right, pick up a ball and throw it around. Five, ten minutes. Then put her in her crate and feed her. Okay. Where does she eat? Oh, she eats in the kitchen. I got one. No, we're going in our crate. Okay. I don't know how you were raised. Greg, but this is how I raise. If you ever watch me eat, I eat my food right away. Yeah. And I'll tell you why. Because I was made to sit at the table, and the only way that I could leave that table is if I ate my dinner. So yeah. I had no nothing else to break my concentration. I ate. One That's thing. All I had to do. One thing I've noticed recently, since I've put her on a diet, um, I'm, and she immediately after she gets done eating, she tries to get into the trash can. Um, of course, it's, it's, you're going to see an increase in bad behavior because she's going to become more predatorial with less food. Yeah, your yeah. That is going to eventually work in your favor. It just isn't going to work in your favor right now. Okay. Give her the opportunities to get to the garbage. Yeah. So you would have a leash connected her, with her, and when she's in the house for a bit, and you watch TV, and you just wait for her to sit down and settle, and then you go, good dog, and then keep watching fucking television. Mm-hmm. Or have your coffee and just sit next to you on a lead. And then put her away. 15 or 20 minutes of that. That's it. Okay. And at night, right. like, is if, uh, so at night, uh, you know, I, I get home from work, I let her out. Schedule. When you get home at night, how much is she out? It, it, you know, it depends if I'm there. I mean, I usually, I'd sit on the back porch and drink a few beers and she sits, you know, she sits 10 feet, 10, 10 or 15 feet away from me typically. In the grass. What do you mean when you're there? So you do something different when you're there as opposed to when you're not? Well, when I'm not there, she's in her crate. Oh, really? So you're associating when you're not there to confinement, and when you're there, you're apologizing with freedom. Well. So why don't we do this? (laughs) It's inevitable that you have to crate her when you're not there, right? So how about when you get a home at night now you've done your business and maybe you're preparing dinner, that you put her back in her crate for an hour, even when you're home. Okay. I heard that okay. Well, what kind of an okay was that? Like, why? Well, think about it. So She's going to scream in her crate when you're home. No, oh, no, I dealt with that tonight. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. So if you keep it pretty regular and she knows what to expect no matter what goes on, are you not going to balance her out? Yeah. Okay. You okay. So, uh, yeah. It's like me. I've got Farrah being adapted to the house. She was out in my kennels or working in my training room. She's out my new house bed. And she's created whether I'm home or not. But every night at the same time after I've had my dinner or whatever, she's brought upstairs into the house for only 30 minutes right now, sometimes 20 <laughs> Because I know what it, so how long she gets before she gets into trouble. And then I'll put her away, and that's going to be consistent for the next two months. I lay her everything, and then she'll be out more and more and more and more. And eventually, she won't be in the crate hardly ever, but she'll be perfectly behaved. Okay. Well, that sounds like a plan. All right, so you got it, Greg? I will send you, I'll send Lauren a review because I don't have your email, and then you get mine. That uh, yeah, that'd be great. Quick point form as to what to do. Okay. And then, uh, but I want you to write this down. I want you to make a chart. What you like about this dog and what you don't like about this dog. Mm-hmm. How you respond to either one, and whether you like what you're responding like. So, do you like being a frustrated, impatient person? No. Yes no? no, I hate it. What? Okay, so if you saw it on paper, what would you do? Uh, I'd probably... Tr- I don't like myself this way, so I better change it. Change exactly. It, yep. Right? Yep. And you'll keep that little notepad. Go 
don't get yourself with no bad and right down notes every day you deal with this dog. Because the, the challenge is not training the dog. If I took that dog within three weeks, you'd be perfect. It's getting people to change so the dog and you can both be good. That's the hard part. Because it's habit, right? And it's subconscious. It's not the obvious. It's what you do naturally based on the circumstances and what's developed. It's just dog's behavior. And yours, you're both feeding off each other, right? No, oh, yeah. One of us has got to stop providing the food. Mm-hmm. Well, we're not going to expect the dog to do it. Nope. Because if we do, then the dog is a boss. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's became obviously clear in the last, you know, uh, couple months that, you know, at least or at least maybe not even that long, but since I first started talking to Lauren seriously about this and we got you involved that uh, sh that she definitely is uh, got me, pen you know, uh, got me all figured out, I guess. Well, and the problem with is is Greg's like, OK, he's a typical dog owner consumer, American consumer. And he says, I have a broken dog. I want to fix it. So I take it to dog training. No. And but it, no. and then the dog trainers go, okay, they need to fix it. This is, this is what I know to do it in this aspect or wherever they're at. And they do the best they can. Um, but a lot of them don't really talk about the owner. And the reason why is they don't want to make them mad. And they're glad that they're reaching... Well, no, not even so much as that is there. I mean, some of them don't get paid nearly as enough. I know, I know when I go down to feeder yeah. supply, they don't, my personal opinion, in my humble opinion, I don't think they get paid enough. And I tell them that all the time. Um, and they say, it's better than not training them. And it's like, that's true. It gives the owner, you know, a, 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 a well, no, it gives them a goal and say, okay, I want the dog. Excuse, you're compensating. You know, and like, I mean, it's better than not training, but if training them is going to damage the dog because the people are still asking the same, so what are you really training? You know, I'll tell you a story, Greg, about this, and then Lawrence heard it too about my dad. And I came home, I was, I was living on my own. I guess I left home at 17, 18, years, 17. I was on the streets, so I was a bad kid. So I got an apartment, I got myself some dogs. I spent six years training them. That's where I got all the training from my teachers. I go to my old man's house, the well-oiled machines. He'll sit, stay down, heal, all of that stuff. Perfect, I don't eat awfully. Other than one thing, couldn't turn my back because if they saw a dog or a person, they'd eat them. Both of them would. No man was impressed. He just looked at me, he goes, okay, what's the big deal here? So I went to work. He had them in the backyard. The old man was, you know, being home during the day with them and, and you know, whatever else. He was semi-retired. I go to the backyard one day and I grab my leash and I say, come on, let's go for a walk. And they look at me like I got three ants. They never moved. And the old man just said one thing to me. All you focused on is what you needed. You didn't give them what they needed. And then he proceeded to show me what the letter of law was. And I said was something, I could never truly have those dogs off leash like I have my dogs now. You never even have to look at them. They stay where they're supposed to be. Or I quietly say a word to them and say, hey, that's not polite or you're being rude and they come and lay down again. He did the same thing and he took them out to the park. Dogs there and then I said, stay beside them left the backyard gate open. All they did was sit in front of the porch waiting for them to come out and went, how the f did you do that? And he said, very simply put, and here's your answer. Do you know what your dog knows? Does the dog know you know? And do both of you know who you are? That's it. These little training classes don't teach that shit. And then in the end, you give this a dog that's fully trained or whatever, or they do the lessons. And what you start to notice is the dog is politically correct like they are until you turn your back, Greg, and it's chasing a cat down the street. Mm -hmm. Or you leave orally, you have to leave the training collar on them for the rest of their lives. That's right. I don't have any collars on my dogs. It's very rare. I thought it would be an inconvenience. Uh, you know, if you look now, I'm on the cell phone, not the bread, and I'm just talking as a teacher hypothetically. I've got three security dogs that I'm letting out right now out of a truck in an open parking lot with no leashes and they go right into the yard and they stay right close to me and these are dogs and these I've seen aren't you. even normal dogs and I've seen you do it I've seen you do it 
Yeah. And you say, don't get out of the truck. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> yeah, you don't, you know, so, but there's three of them, and there's two males and one female, no fighting, they do what they're told, and it's the same when I pick them up in the morning. I just open the truck, so get in the cage, and they're all jumping in automatically. This isn't training. This is a habit based on trust. Mm -hmm. And these dogs will hurt you. I mean, the one, one of the males bit me in the head for giving him a bath just two weeks ago. Go. <laughs> right? They're volatile animals. They've been badly damaged. And all three of these dogs came from pampered homes. They weren't tied to trees or left neglected in the backyard. They came from pampered homes. Or, were they trained to do schutzen? Were they trained to do any kind of attack? No. Nope. kid. Sad. I don't train security dogs. I take and up dogs. And they're... If they turn around, I adopt them out or sell them. Yeah. That's what I've always done. That's my way of rescuing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, that gives All him right. a lot to work you got on. Any questions, Greg? I think I'm good, but I, I'll tell you what, I'm going to simmer on this and I'm probably going to listen to this again. And, uh, I'd like to, if you, if you do email Lauren, I'll, you know, take a look at that. If I have any questions, I'll email you. No problem. Okay. Awesome. Well, thanks. I don't know if there's anything that, that shows the beginning of how to start on those YouTube videos. I need to do more of your camera. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.